Hey y'all, welcome to my kitchen. Uh, today is the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and as such, I am watching football and making Thanksgiving turkey leftover gumbo. Uh, it's gumbo season down here on the Gulf Coast, and you could use your leftover Thanksgiving turkey if you ate it all. Maybe you or someone you knew you know, shot a bunch of ducks. Uh, you could just go get a rotisserie chicken. There's a lot of different ways you can you can do this. Uh, but there's no denying that you need you need to eat gumbo right now. Uh, what you can see I'm doing right now. I'm chopping some onions and gotta get the knife sharp first. Heck, in the gumbo, you could even add some venison if if you've got some some nice venison that somebody uh, recently recently shot. So it doesn't matter too much what what your protein is. I t tend to stick to to poultry. Maybe you get a, a little later in the year and you got some uh, quail and pheasant. Uh, go great in it also. And uh, perfect complement to to watching the final uh, LSU football game of the season uh, they're playing texas a&m right now it's actually why we got a voice over here because <laughs> the background inevitably had lots of uh lsu football going on and <laughs> i don't have the rights to that uh lsu a&m saturday after thanksgiving been a tradition for for a few years before that it was uh before that it was arkansas and this is probably the last year that LSU will have regular A and M the Saturday after Thanksgiving, thanks to the the conference realign, realignment and the uh, enlarging of the SEC. But I'm sure LSU will continue to play somebody this day, and uh, I heard it might actually go back to being Arkansas. We'll see. Nevertheless, LSU game good excuse to make some gumbo. Getting an my about two and a half cups of of onions chopped there uh got it sped up because you don't need to, to to watch me slowly chop onions for the whole the whole time and, it, and this video will be a little different it has a few jump jump cuts a few uh a few sped up segments just uh because taking cooking gumbo takes all day almost and you don't need to watch every every second of simmering gumbo on the pot. So we sped things up to, to try and keep this reasonable. So, you know, it's, it's not just our tradition either. It's all over the Gulf Coast, specifically South Louisiana, that this time of year is for gumbo. In fact, there's a, a saying down here, gumbo weather. Once you get that first cold snap, you want something warm inside of you. Gumbo does the trick. It also happens to be the time that people tend to have uh, leftover turkey and have, you know, fowl that they, they've, they've shot around. So, uh, perfect for this. So, I'm using sweet yellow onions here. I, I tend to like that for for dishes where I'm sauteing them down want them to really kind of just dissolve and incorporate uh, especially with that roux it's bitter but it's got hints of chocolate so nice sweet onion here uh <laughs> begun chopping sausage uh, it's andouille you can use a, a good smoked sausage if you don't have andouille but i really prefer andouille for this it adds a good saltiness and and punch to the gumbo that the, the smoked sausage just doesn't quite have. Uh, I, I like for this size of gumbo to have about three pounds. Um, this Manda that I bought here actually turns out each each package was a little less than a pound. So I don't quite have three pounds, uh, but I, I still have a good bit. And uh, when I slice it, I tend to slice half of it into little quarter rounds uh, and then half of it I'll slice in the medallion. So here you can see I'm slicing the quarter rounds. They're each about a half an inch thick. Uh, 
I don't try to get it uniform. In fact, I, I intentionally try to have some variation in the size. I like to have different size chunks for browning and for cooking in the gumbo purposes because they will, uh, they'll just each reduce to different, different sizes, different, uh, shapes and whatnot. And it just, it just adds a lot of, a lot of variety and texture. So, you know, don't tr tr aim not to be too uniform. And then, uh, I also slice these little medallions. I slice them on a bias so I can get a nice large surface area of uh, interior sausage area, not just the skin. I don't want um, don't want all of the fat to be sequestered in the meat. I, I tend to make these these a little thinner. There, you can see. Uh, so it's just a, a variety of of different different shapes and sizes for the sausage really, really adds something. Uh, and, you know, some of these, you, you might think that they, they look a little large for, for, say, fitting on a spoon. But between browning them and then simmering them in the gumbo, these are going to reduce a lot. As that sausage, uh, the meat and sausage gets exposed to the heat, um, it... It's going to contract. It's going to shrink. Uh, particularly those medallions might curl a little. And and they'll get smaller. So don't worry about them. They're, they're large before they're cooked when you need them to be for browning. Uh, and they're smaller than when once they're in the gumbo. So it really works out nicely. Uh, so at this point... Uh, I'm just moving the cutting board out of the way. Uh, I have the stock pot I ultimately did not end up using because it was too small up there, so I set it there. Uh, and I'm grabbing up my saucier. I don't I don't have a lot of history using a saucier. This is a made in brand one. I had been looking at getting clad cookware recently and Maiden had a really good sale on this saucier, and I didn't have one, so it was really filling in a hole in my uh, my cookware. So I, I got it, and I've been super pleased. Uh, not only is a saucier really, like, as the name describes, the perfect vessel for making a lot of sauces, it's also great for making roux. Uh, it's it doesn't have the corners that the flour can get trapped in in a roux. And so it's it's a lot easier to to just keep that flour moving. Uh, sauces that you want to toss a little, those rounded edges, they really make it easy to just flip the sauce around in. And uh, and Made In really has a, a quality product there. This is not sponsored. I'd love for them to sponsor me. Uh, it's got that... Uh, that multi-layer construction you expect of a clad product, uh, you know, bomb-proof stainless steel. And to top all that off, it's not made in China. Uh, I believe this one is made in Italy. Uh, some of them are made in, some, some of their vessels are made in the United States, some are made in Italy. They're, uh, they're blue steel made in France, which that's where you want your, 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 you know, carbon steel stuff to come from is France. Uh, and in fact, I've heard rumor, it's, it's at least from the same town that the Matfer Borgia is from. So it wouldn't surprise me if there's, if not the same factory, there's a lot of the same skills, the same, uh, the, the people that know these vessels, making them generations of craftsmanship. Um, are that knowledge is carried over. So I, I do generally tend to prefer made in the USA stuff. I absolutely spend more money to buy made in the USA stuff. But there are times that other Western nations that are uh, contributing to, you know, 
liberty and freedom and also to the you know meaningful economy of the, the western world these countries it's okay to buy a product from them and made in does a great job at sourcing their products from these countries and it's not even necessarily for that reason it's for the craftsmanship reason this has been a great great bit uh uh so we're going to be making a roof, so we need some roux beers. First, uh, I have there the Hofbrau Oktoberfest. I decided to kind of go an Oktoberfest route today. Um, and that little spoiler, that beer is done before I actually even start making the roux. So here I'm browning the sausage. It takes a, a good bit to brown this much sausage. Uh, we, we want to get some nice browning there, and I, I was attempting to render out the fat to saute the onions. This sausage just ended up not being very fatty, and the, this, the as you can see, it, it just didn't end up being very fatty, didn't render out a lot of fat. Got some nice browning on there, and at this point, I'm going to set it aside. I did get some nice fond on the bottom, and... Because I happen to have a nice Oktoberfest beer there, I, uh, you know, I pour, pour one out for, for my brown sausage bits. So, get capture that nice fond. Uh, you do get to watch me here, fumble a little with sausage stuck to the bottom of the pan, not not scooping out into the bowl. Trying to, trying to loosen it just by shaking it. Ultimately, I have to put it back on the fire and give it, just give it some uh, applied pressure. <laughs> but uh, I would say use a good undoey, but you don't need to use your, your absolute best undoey for this one. You can if you want but it's gonna be simmered down in the gumbo for a while. And uh, some andouille that maybe you've spent a little bit more money on might have the depth and complexity of the flavor uh, lost in the gumbo a little bit. I, I used Manda here, Richard's is always good. Uh, I've used uh, Savoie's, good number of other ones usually. Uh, just kind of tend to go with what's available. Um, sometimes, you know, you, you hit three pounds right after Thanksgiving. Grocery store might be, you might need to split it between two different varieties. So if you make that trip to Laplace, Louisiana, and get the, uh, the, the nice andouille, uh, you know, yeah, sure, you could put it in your gumbo, but that also might be nice just just eating on its own and use something a, a little bit more mass-produced for this. I'll just uh, pour those drippings that I deglazed the fond uh, with the beer just right over the sausage because that, that old bowl is going to get dumped into the gumbo pot later. At this point, I... Uh, Decide that I, I need to add fat since I don't have really any any sausage fat rendered out to, to speak of. So I, I clean out that and then I, I'm just going to grab some butter and toss some butter in here. I, I'm going to go with unsalted since we're cooking sausage in there. Uh, Putting, I'm sautéing onions that have, I've salted them to, to release a little bit of their moisture. So I don't want to add too much salt. So get my butter melted. I'm going to just grab my onions here, dump them in. Again, two and a half cups of onions. And then once I get the onions in there, it's time to add. For this, I added a, in total about a, a teaspoon of baking soda. 
maybe a little less than that. Uh, as I've said before, it, it, it really helps cook down the onions a little bit faster. And in a dish like gumbo, where you really do want the onions to just kind of dissolve and become essential to your 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 broth, not broth, but your uh, your soup, your your fluid of your soup. This this method really works well for there. It gets in a nice caramelized taste. And uh, needed a little bit more butter in there. So we melt that and then we, uh, we cook these onions down. And wanted to get them at least to the point where they're translucent uh, with the baking soda. We ended up getting them a little bit further. Uh, You'll, you'll see here in a second, we're going to cut and we're going to have some nice golden onion, almost mush. Uh, this really turned out well. This is getting the onions here. Just really works well for something like a gumbo or a etouffee. Where you, you want that just nice and cooked down to to mix smoothly and seamlessly with your your fluid. Uh, now we're going to go ahead and add our bell peppers. Uh, we had some some leftover chopped bell peppers from all the Thanksgiving stuff. I had the celery, same leftover chopped celery from all the Thanksgiving food prep. The celery had gotten a little bit watery. Did have a, a little chunk of celery we see in there, but a lot of it had just really, really kind of liquefied, which is fine. We put the fluid in, we put the, the fibrous bits in, cook it down it's uh it's gonna work well <laughs> nothing nothing to stress about there it, it ended up turning out great so we want to saute the uh bell pepper and celery just until they're really kind of giving up that any any crunch they have any any bounce they have just get nice and soft probably just a minute or two. And then we'll go ahead and set those aside and begin making our roux. In here already, I have some clarified butter. And to the clarified butter, I am adding, well, what butter was clarified? It was just the leftover rest of that stick from what I cut for uh, the, the onions. Ultimately, in terms of root quantities, what I will tell you here is ratios are the most important thing to remember. There's a book, in fact, called Ratio about cooking. Phenomenal book. I highly recommend it. And it taught me a little bit about roux. Someone that has grown up making roux. Um, and I guess the first thing it taught me is that the ratios are important. That's... Ultimately, you want to get to a certain volume of roux, and it's a ratio of oil to flour. I say oil, scratch that. It's a ratio of fat to flour to finished roux. And due to the nature of the flour, the volume of flour to finished roux is a one-to-one -one ratio. So I wanted to end up with five cups of root for this dish. So I needed five cups of flour. The second thing that the book ratio taught me is also something that I've heard other uh, professional chefs that have studied, tested different methods, different techniques, is that most people use far too much fat in their room. It shouldn't be a one-to-one -one ratio of fat to flour. It should be a one to two-thirds ratio, really, of flour to fat. So if you're using one cup of flour, you should be using two-thirds of a cup of fat. 
my total fat, including the oil and the clarified butter, should be that two-thirds. I, I just had that butter there, wanted to add a little bit of butter flavor to the gumbo. You could use all oil. If you wanted to clarify your, that much butter, you could use all... Oh, you could use all butter. One thing that I also tend to do sometimes is I'll, I'll just go ahead and make a big batch of brew ahead and just save that. You can freeze it. You can keep it in the fridge for at least a week, but sealed in an airtight container. Oh, it's time for the, uh, the spot in Oktoberfest. Uh, sealed in an airtight container, that, that really can last in the fridge two or three weeks. And if you're not going to use it that quickly, freeze it. Uh, so ultimately here, I was looking for five cups of roux. So to get five cups of roux, I used five cups of flour. And then the total amount of fat for that, well, it's two-thirds of five cups, uh, which, you know, is 3.333 or three and a third total cups of fat and I had about two-thirds of a cup of clarified butter so it was two and two-thirds of a cup of oil with two-thirds of a cup of clarified butter that that specific breakdown isn't horribly important the thing that I want you to remember is that you should have two-thirds of volume of fat for every volume of flour. And for here, we're going for a total of five cups of flour to get a, a, a total of five cups of roux. So uh, at this point, you can see the roux, uh, a little frothy. Uh, oh, oh, this, this is my other, that's a roux stir. You can get those around South Louisiana. That is a great spoon you saw it had that flat tip there great spoon for for making a roux particularly if you have a flat bottom uh skillet or something with corners that really is good at getting the flour out of those corners since i have the saucier here uh i, I wanted to stick with the slightly smaller wooden spoon uh just just for this particular vessel but if I'm doing skillet or a big pot, yeah, particularly if you need to reach down to the big pot, you can get those roosters with nice long handles. So we've got a couple different lengths for a couple different size pots. Great tool. Highly suggest you get one. Uh, so I was saying uh, we're kind of stepping through the stages of the roux here. Uh, we're getting a little frothy here. Uh, the, the most frothy was actually off camera, and we're going to kind of cut to after that. Uh, that frothiness occurs because uh, there's actually a good bit of moisture in your flour. It feels dry, but buried within the the germ of the the flour, there's moisture. And well, when you're making a roux, so when you're making a roux, what you're essentially doing is you're you're toasting the flour by deep frying it in fat. And uh, what I was pointing out there, temperature wise, is I when I do my roux, I start high. I start medium high heat or even a little higher. As long as you're frothing, you're, you're boiling off water. You're not going to burn your roux. As if you stir while you're frothing, you won't burn your roux. And so I stay at medium high. And then once I start to get darker and darker colors, as you're seeing, I'm turning down the temperature. And uh, once you get, this is maybe just a hair short of milk chocolate. That's sort of that milk chocolate color there. I want to be kind of below medium at this point. Uh, I will no note that my, my lights shining on my roux there <laughs> from my hood are really bright, so the roux is a little bit darker than it appears here on camera. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're frying the flour to toast it. As that moisture gets released, it froths. And uh, a lot of people get despondent because their roux isn't darkening at that point. 
But when you're frothing and you see all the, 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 those bubbles coming up, that moisture getting released, that's progress. You, you just got to trust the stages of the rue or each making a step. And you'll get there. You'll get to dark sooner or later. But it takes patience, and uh, rather than cooking slow the entire time, I do like to start hot and slowly turn down the heat. Each time you see that color kind of tick up to a darker shade, just ease the heat down a little, a tiny bit. Uh, at this point, you know, like I said, I'm just a hair under medium. Uh, and eventually I get sort of that, that rich, dark chocolate color. And when, when we get to that color, it's, uh, it, it's time to take the next steps. So you look at that color. We're going to turn the heat off. And then we're going to put the veggies in because these have a lot of moisture in. We uh, immediately start steaming and bubbling up. But steaming and bubbling up means the roux has stopped cooking the flour is now instead cooking the veggies. So you gotta keep stirring here to keep those veggies from sticking to the bottom. We did have uh, a little little splash out of the, the pan you can see there. Uh, so I had to, to clean it up a little bit. Uh, again, my, my fire is off. This is cooking just from the heat that is being stored in that hot fat. But those veggies are slowing down their cooking process and the, uh, the temperature is dropping a little bit. So once, once you get all that incorporated, look at the nice dark color. Once you get all that incorporated, what you're going to want to do is get out your cold turkey stock. I made this from the carcass and we're going to start adding the roux in. It's, it, it's really best to use a cold stock because it's going to stop any cooking that may be going on in your, your hot roux. But even if you're using a cold roux that you'd cooked before, cold stock is good also because it's not going to overhydrate your flour, which leads to clumping, which leads to you pulling out an immersion blender to get your clumps out. It's not the end of the world. Uh, I've, I've rescued many a clumpy stock before when adding the roux, uh, but it'll save you a lot of effort if your stock is cold. And if your stock isn't cold, you know, what you're probably going to want to do is take a little bit of warm stock, add it to your roux, stir it around, temper it, take a little bit of that mixture of warm stock and roux and add it back to your, your stock pot and just kind of tempering back and forth bit by bit until they're they're totally mixed. We'll speed it up a little bit so that uh, we can get through the the emptying of the room into the stock pot. Uh, trying to work with the camera underneath my ventilation hood here, uh, <laughs> made for fun fun challenges here. I get all that room in the stock pot, and then the next thing is to add. Uh, oh. All right, so now our next step is to add the turkey. Here is basically three quarters of a turkey. We had eaten one of the breasts, but this is all of the dark meat and one of the breasts. Uh, ideally, for a, a gumbo this size, you are going to want to have Oh, about eight pounds of cooked poultry meat. So your 12-pound turkey, you, you basically are going to want all of it. Or in the ideal world, you add your turkey that you have left over and you add some duck or some pheasant, quail, woodcock, you know, whatever, whatever has come from the field. So we've added our sausage now. We're going to stir this all together. And uh, then, then we're going to talk about secrets. Because there's a lot of dark roux out there that are delicious. And they all have a, a flavor. It's just an intangible essence that just really makes them taste 
a certain way. And uh, when you, you ask people, they always tell you that there's a secret ingredient they won't tell you about. And uh, they never say what it is. And then you throw a little bottle away and you make sure to cover it with a paper towel. Because not only do you have a secret, you also have a little bit of shame. But then the color of your gumbo, <laughs> it really it turns into something different. And frankly, it adds a flavor. Uh, there's a lot of caramel in those sorts of browning sauces. Add some uh, Creole seasoning here. Add a little bit more. That's a lot of water in there. Uh, and what we don't show off camera here. Oh, got to add that uh, little Louisiana vinegar sauce. I think uh, I added five dashes here. And then off camera right before serving, I added another three. And it still could have had a couple. <laughs> Uh, so off camera, what we don't see here, I added five cloves of garlic minced and a bay leaf. Uh, oh, and then shortly before serving, you do want to add some filet. How much filet to add? Well... Family members don't speak to each other anymore because of disagreements over this. Fist fights have broken out. Generally, I don't add much. Maybe for a pot this size, I will add at most a tablespoon, but more likely a teaspoon. And then when I'm about to serve it, I'll leave the filet there for people to add some. So raise your, your gumbo to a boil. Once you get it to a boil, you're going to turn that heat to its lowest setting and let it simmer there for one hour. So once you've got it, got it simmered, we're going to, we're going to walk away. Set a gumbo timer. Let that go for one hour. For an hour. One hour. Ooh. One hour. Doesn't that look good? So this is the point where you would add that filet. I didn't capture it on camera, but uh, I didn't didn't add a overwhelming amount, so I ended up adding some when I served myself. And uh, now is the serve myself part. I scooped out a lot of of the turkey meat sausage so I needed to top it off with a little bit of just the, the liquid and uh, of course rice uh, I really suggest you go make a, a batch of no BS rice during that one hour while it's simmering I'll put a little card there for uh, you to click on the, the link to the no BS rice recipe and uh, and it turned out good look at that go make this you You'll, you'll really enjoy having a, a southern way to reuse turkey leftovers. This isn't turkey noodle soup or turkey quesadillas. This is, this is the real way turkey should be used. So go ahead, hit like, hit subscribe. Hit that little bell for notifications. Do the internet video thing so that the satellites can link up in outer space. And... Uh, and servers can word a life, and you can get recommendations for more videos like this. Uh, thanks for watching. Y'all have a good one. Bye.